On the Gull's Road by Willa Cather This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE AMBASSADOR'S STORY It often happens that one or another of my friends stops before a red chalk drawing in my study and asks me where I ever found so lovely a creature. I have never told the story of that picture to anyone, and the beautiful woman on the wall until yesterday and all these twenty years has spoken to no one but me. Yesterday a young painter, a countryman of mine, came to consult me on a matter of business, and upon seeing my drawing of Alexandra Ebling, straightway forgot his errand. He examined the date upon the sketch and asked me very earnestly if I could tell him whether the lady were still living. When I answered him, he stepped back from the picture and said slowly, So long ago. She must have been very young. She was happy? As to that, who can say about any one of us, I replied. Out of all that is supposed to make for happiness, she had very little. He shrugged his shoulders and turned away to the window, saying as he did so, Well, there is very little use in troubling about anything when we can stand here and look at her, and you can tell me that she has been dead all these years and that she had very little. We returned to the object of his visit, but when he bade me good-bye at the door, his troubled gaze again went back to the drawing, and it was only by turning sharply about that he took his eyes away from her. I went back to my study fire, and as the rain kept away less impetuous visitors, I had a long time in which to think of Mrs. Ebling. I even got out the little box she gave me which I had not opened for years. And when Mrs. Hemway brought my tea, I had barely time to close the lid and defeat her disapproving gaze. My young countryman's perplexity as he looked at Mrs. Ebling had recalled to me the delight and pain she gave me when I was of his years. I sat looking at her face and trying to see it through his eyes, freshly, as I saw it first upon the deck of the Germania, twenty years ago. Was it her loveliness, I often asked myself, or her loneliness, or her simplicity, or was it merely my own youth? Was her mystery only that of the mysterious north out of which she came? I still feel that she was very different from all the beautiful and brilliant women I have known as the night is different from the day, or as the sea is different from the land. But this is our story, as it comes back to me. For two years I have been studying Italian and working in the capacity of clerk to the American legation at Rome, and I was going home to secure my first consular appointment. Upon boarding my steamer at Genoa, I saw my luggage into my cabin, and then started for a rapid circuit of the deck. Everything promised well. The boat was thinly peopled, even for a July crossing. The decks were roomy, the day was fine, the sea was blue. I was sure of my appointment, and best of all, I was coming back to Italy. All these things were in my mind, when I stopped sharply before a chaise long placed sideways near the stern. Its occupant was a woman, apparently ill, who lay with her eyes closed, and in her open arm was a chubby little red-haired girl, asleep. I can still remember that first glance at Mrs. Ebling, and how I stopped as a wheel does when the band slips. Her splendid, vigorous body lay still and relaxed under the loose folds of her clothing. Her white throat and arms and red-gold hair were drenched with sunlight. Such hair as it was, wayward as some kind of gleaming seaweed that curls and undulates with the tide. A moment gave me her face, the high cheekbones, the thin cheeks, the gentle chin arching back to a girlish throat, and singular loveliness of the mouth. Even then it flashed through me that the mouth gave the whole face its peculiar beauty and distinction, 
It was proud and sad and tender and strangely calm. The curve of the lips could not have been cut more cleanly with the most delicate instrument, and whatever shade of feeling passed over them seemed to partake of their exquisiteness. But I am anticipating. While I stood stupidly staring, as if at twenty-five I had never before beheld a beautiful woman, the whistles broke into a hoarse scream, and the deck under us began to vibrate. The woman opened her eyes, and the little girl struggled into a sitting position, rolled out of her mother's arm, and ran to the deck rail. After putting my chair near the stern, I went forward to see the gangplank up, and did not return until we were dragging out to sea at the end of a long tow line. The woman in the chaise long was still alone. She lay there all day, looking at the sea. The little girl, Karen, played noisily about the deck. Occasionally she returned and struggled up into the chair, plunged her head round and red as a little pumpkin against her mother's shoulder in an impetuous embrace, and then struggled down again with a lively flourishing of arms and legs. Her mother took such opportunities to pull up the child's socks or to smooth the fiery little braids. Her beautiful hands, rather large and very white, played about the riotous little girl with a quieting tenderness. Karen chattered away in Italian and kept asking for her father, only to be told that he was busy. When any of the ship's officers passed, they stopped for a word with my neighbor, and I heard the first mate address her as Mrs. Ebling. When they spoke to her, she smiled appreciatively and answered in low, faltering Italian. But I fancied that she was glad when they passed on, and left her to her fixed contemplation of the sea. Her eyes seemed to drink the color of it all day long, and after every interruption they went back to it. There was a kind of pleasure in watching her satisfaction, a kind of excitement in wondering what the water made her remember or forget. She seemed not to wish to talk to anyone, but I knew that I should like to hear whatever she might be thinking. One could catch some hint of her thoughts, I imagined, from the shadows that came and went across her lips like the reflection of light clouds. She had a pile of books beside her, but she did not read, and neither could I. I gave up trying at last and watched the sea, very conscious of her presence, almost of her thoughts. When the sun dropped low and shone in her face, I rose and asked if she would like me to move her chair. She smiled and thanked me, but said the sun was good for her. Her yellow hazel eyes followed me for a moment, and then went back to the sea. After the first bugle sounded for dinner, a heavy man in uniform came up the deck and stood beside the chaise long, looking at its two occupants with a smile of satisfied possession. The breast of his trim coat was hidden by waves of soft blonde beard, as long and heavy as a woman's hair, which blew about his face in glittering profusion. He wore a large turquoise ring upon the thick hand that he rubbed good-humouredly over the little girl's head. To her he spoke Italian, but he and his wife conversed in some Scandinavian tongue. He stood stroking his fine beard until the second bugle blew, then bent stiffly from his hips like a soldier and patted his wife's hand as it lay on the arm of her chair. He hurried down the deck, taking stock of the passengers as he went, and stopped before a thin girl with frizzled hair and a lace coat, asking her a facetious question in thick English. They began to talk about Chicago, and went below. Later I saw him at the head of his table in the dining room, the befrizzled Chicago lady on his left. They must have gotten a famous start at luncheon, for by the end of the dinner Ebling was peeling figs for her and presenting them on the end of a fork. The doctor confided to me that Ebling was the chief engineer and the dandy of the boat, but this time he would have to behave himself, for he had brought his sick wife along for the voyage. She had a bad heart valve, he added, and was in a serious way. After dinner Ebling disappeared, presumably to his engines, and at ten o'clock, when the stewardess came to put Mrs. Ebling to bed, I helped her to rise from her chair, and the second mate ran up and supported her down to her cabin. About midnight I found the engineer in the card room, playing with the doctor, an Italian naval officer, and the commodore of a Long Island yacht club. His face was even pinker than it had been at dinner, 
and his fine beard was full of smoke. I thought a long while about Ebling and his wife before I went to sleep. The next morning we tied up at Naples to take on our cargo, and I went on shore for the day. I did not, however, entirely escape the ubiquitous engineer, whom I saw lunching with a Long Island Commodore at a hotel in the Santa Lucia. When I returned to the boat in the early evening, the passengers had gone down to dinner, and I found Mrs. Ebling quite alone upon the deserted deck. I approached her and asked whether she had had a dull day. She looked up smiling and shook her head, as if her Italian had quite failed her. I saw that she was flushed with excitement, and her yellow eyes were shining like two clear topazes. Dull? Oh, no. I love to watch Naples from the sea in this white heat. She has just lain there on her hillside among the vines and laughed for me all day long. I have been able to pick out many of the places I like best. I felt that she was really going to talk to me at last. She had turned to me frankly as to an old acquaintance and seemed not to be hiding from me anything of what she felt. I sat down in a glow of pleasure and excitement and asked her if she knew Naples well. Oh, yes. I lived there for a year after I was first married. My husband has a great many friends in Naples. But he was at sea most of the time, so I went about alone. Nothing helps one to know a city like that. I came first by sea like this, directly to Naples from Finnmark, and I had never been south before. Mrs. Ebling stopped and looked over my shoulder. Then with a quick, eager glance at me, she said abruptly, It was like a baptism of fire. Nothing has ever been quite the same since. Imagine how this bay looked to a Finnmark girl. It seemed like the overture to Italy. I laughed. And then one goes up the country, song by song, and wine by wine. Mrs. Ebling sighed. Ah, oh, yes, it must be fine to follow it. I have never been away from the seaports myself. We live now in Genoa. The deck steward brought her tray, and I moved forward a little and stood by the rail. When I looked back, she smiled and nodded to let me know that she was not missing anything. I could feel her intentness as keenly as if she were standing beside me. The sun had disappeared over the high ridge behind the city, and the stone pines stood black and flat against the fires of the afterglow. The lilac haze that hung over the long, lazy slopes of Vesuvius warmed with golden light, and films of blue vapor began to float down towards Bayi. The sky, the sea, and the city between them turned a shimmering violet, fading grayer as the lights began to glow like luminous pearls along the waterfront the necklace of an irreclaimable queen. Behind me I heard a low exclamation, a slight stifled sound, but it seemed the perfect vocalization of that weariness with which we at last let go of beauty, after we have held it until the senses are darkened. When I turned to her again, she seemed to have fallen asleep. That night, as we were moving out to sea and the tail lights of Naples were winking across the widening stretch of black water, I helped Mrs. Ebling to the foot of the stairway. She drew herself up from her chair with effort and leaned on me wearily. I could have carried her all night without fatigue. "'May I come and talk to you tomorrow? I asked. She did not reply at once. "'Like an old friend?' I added. She gave me her languid hand, and her mouth set with the exertion of walking, softened altogether. "'Grazia,' she murmured. I returned to the deck and joined a group of my countrywomen, who, primed with inexhaustible information, were discussing the baseness of Renaissance art. They were intelligent and alert, and as they leaned forward in their deck chairs under the circle of light, their faces recalled to me Rembrandt's picture of a clinical lecture. I heard them through, against my will, and then went to the stern to smoke and see the last of the island lights. The sky had clouded over, and a soft, melancholy wind was rushing over the sea. I could not help thinking how disappointed I would be if rain should keep Mrs. Ebling in her cabin tomorrow. My mind played constantly with her image. At one moment she was very clear and directly in front of me, the next she was far away. 
Whatever else I thought about, some part of my consciousness was busy with Mrs. Ebling, hunting for her, finding her, losing her, then groping again. How was it that I was so conscious of whatever she might be feeling? That when she sat still behind me and watched the evening sky, I had a sense of speed and change, almost of danger. And when she was tired and sighed, I had wished for night and loneliness. 2. Though when we are young we seldom think much about it, there is now and again a golden day when we feel a sudden arrogant pride in our youth, in the lightness of our feet and the strength of our arms, in the warm fluid that courses so surely within us, when we are conscious of something powerful and mercurial in our breasts, which comes up, wave after wave, and leaves us irresponsible and free. All the next morning I felt this flow of life, which continually impelled me towards Mrs. Ebling. After the merest greeting, however, I kept away. I found it pleasant to thwart myself, to measure myself against a current that was sure to carry me with it in the end. I was content to let her watch the sea, the sea that seemed now to have come into me, warm and soft, still and strong. I played shuffleboard with a commodore, who was anxious to keep down his figure, and ran around the deck with the stout legs of the little pumpkin-colored Karen about my neck. It was not until the child was having her afternoon nap below that I at last came up and stood beside her mother. "'You are better today,' I exclaimed, looking down at her white gown. She colored unreasonably, and I laughed with a familiarity which she must have accepted as the mere foolish noise of happiness, or it would have seemed impertinent. We talked at first of a hundred trivial things, and we watched the sea. The coast of Sardinia had lain to our port for some hours, and would lie there for hours to come, now advancing in rocky promontories, now retreating behind blue bays. It was the naked south coast of the island, and though our course held very near the shore, not a village or habitation was visible. There was not even a goatherd's hut hidden away among the low pinkish sand hills, pinkish sand hills and yellow headlands, with dull-colored shrubby bushes massed around their bases and following the dried watercourses. A narrow strip of beach glistened like white paint between the purple sea and the umber rocks, and the whole island lay gleaming in the yellow sunshine and translucent air. Not a wave broke on that fringe of white sands, not the shadow of a cloud played across the bare hills, in the air about us there was no sound but that of a vessel moving rapidly through absolutely still water. She seemed like some great sea animal, swimming silently, her head well up. The sea before us was so rich and heavy and opaque that it might have been lapis lazuli. It was the blue of legend, simply, the color that satisfies the soul like sleep. And it was of the sea we talked, for it was the substance of Mrs. Ebling's story. She seemed always to have been swept along by ocean streams, warm or cold, and to have hovered about the edge of great waters. She was born and had grown up in a little fishing town on the Arctic Ocean. Her father was a doctor, a widower, who lived with his daughter and who divided his time between his books and his fishing rod. Her uncle was skipper on a coasting vessel, and with him she had made many trips along the Norwegian coast. But she was always reading and thinking about the blue seas of the south. There was a curious old woman in our village, Dame Erickson, who had been in Italy in her youth. She had gone to Rome to study art, and had copied a great many pictures there. She was well-connected, but had little money, and as she grew older and poorer, she sold her pictures one by one, until there was scarcely a well-to-do family in our district that did not own one of Dame Erickson's paintings but she brought home many other strange things, a little orange tree which she cherished until the day of her death, and bits of colored marble, and seashells, and pieces of coral, and a thin flask full of water from the Mediterranean. When I was a little girl she used to show me her things, and tell me about the south, about the coral fishes, and the pink islands, and the smoking mountains, and the old underground Naples. I suppose the water in her flask was like any other, but it never seemed so to me. It looked so elastic and alive, 
that I used to think if one unsealed the bottle, something penetrating and fruitful might leap out and work an enchantment over Finmark. Lars Ebling, I learned, was one of her father's friends. She could remember him from the time when she was a little girl, and he a dashing young man who used to come home from the sea and make a stir in the village. After he got his promotion to an Atlantic liner and went south, she did not see him until the summer she was twenty, when he came home to marry her. That was five years ago. The little girl, Karen, was three. From her talk, one might have supposed that Ebling was proprietor of the Mediterranean and its adjacent lands, and could have kept her away at his pleasure. Her own rights in him she seemed not to consider. But we wasted very little time on Lars Ebling. We talked like two very young persons of arms and men, of the sea beneath us and the shores it washed. We were carried a little beyond ourselves, for we were in the presence of the things of youth, that never change, fleeing past them. Tomorrow they would be gone, and no effort of will or memory could bring them back again. All about us was the sea of great adventure, and below us, caught somewhere in its gleaming meshes, were the bones of nations and navies, nations and navies that gave youth its hope, and made life something more than a hunger of the bowels. The unpeopled Sardinian coast unfolded gently before us like something left over out of a world that was gone, a place that might well have had no later news since the corn ships brought the tidings of Actium. "'I shall never go to Sardinia,' said Mrs. Ebling. "'It could not possibly be as beautiful as this.' "'Neither shall I,' I replied. As I was going down to dinner that evening, I was stopped by Lars Ebling, freshly brushed and scented wearing a white uniform, and polished and glistening as one of his own engines. He smiled at me with his own kind of geniality. "'You have been very kind to talk to my wife,' he explained. "'It is very bad for her, this trip, that she speaks no English. I am indebted to you.' I told him curtly that he was mistaken, but my acrimony made no impression upon his blandness. I felt that I should certainly strike the fellow if he stood there much longer, running his blue ring up and down his beard. I should have probably hated any man who was Mrs. Ebling's husband, but Ebling made me sick. 3. The next day I began my drawing of Mrs. Ebling. She seemed pleased and a little puzzled when I asked her to sit for me. It occurred to me that she had always been among dull people who took her looks as a matter of course, and that she was not at all sure that she was really beautiful. I can see now her quick, confused look of pleasure. I thought very little about the drawing then, except that the making of it gave me an opportunity to study her face, to look as long as I pleased into her yellow eyes, at the noble lines of her mouth, at her splendid, vigorous hair. We have a yellow vine at home, I told her, that is very like your hair. It seems to be growing while one looks at it, and it twines and tangles about itself and throws out little tendrils in the wind. Has it any name? We call it Love Vine. How little a thing could disconcert her. As for me, nothing disconcerted me. I awoke every morning with a sense of speed and joy. At night I loved to hear the swish of the water rushing by. As fast as the pistons could carry us, as fast as the water could bear us, we were going forward to something delightful, to something together. When Mrs. Ebling told me that she and her husband would be five days in the docks in New York and then return to Genoa, I was not disturbed, for I did not believe her. I came and went, and she sat still all day watching the water. I heard an American lady say that she watched it like one who was going to die. But even that did not frighten me. I somehow felt that she had promised me to live. All those long blue days when I sat beside her talking about Finmark and the sea, she must have known that I loved her. I sat with my hands idle on my knees and let the tide come up in me. It carried me so swiftly that across the narrow space of deck between us it must have swayed her, too, a little. I had no wish to disturb or distress her. If a little, a very little of it reached her, I was satisfied. If it drew her softly, 
but drew her. I wanted no more. Sometimes I could see that even the light pressure of my thoughts made her paler. One still evening, after a long talk, she whispered to me, You must go and walk now, and don't think about me. She had been held too long and too closely in my thoughts, and she begged me to release her for a little while. I went out into the bow and put her far away at the skyline with the faintest star and thought of her gently across the water. When I went back to her, she was asleep. But even in those first days I had my hours of misery. Why, for instance, should she have been born in Finnmark, and why should Lars Ebling have been her only door of escape? Why should she be silently taking leave of the world at the age when I was just beginning it, having had nothing, nothing of whatever is worth while? She never talked about taking leave of things, and yet I sometimes felt that she was counting the sunsets. One yellow afternoon, when we were gliding between the shores of Spain and Africa, she spoke of her illness for the first time. I had got some magnolias at Gibraltar and she wore a bunch of them in her girdle, and the rest lay on her lap. She held the cool leaves against her cheek and fingered the white petals. I can never, she remarked, get enough of the flowers of the South. They make me breathless, just as they did at first. Because of them, I should like to live a long while, almost forever. I leaned forward and looked at her. We could live almost forever if we had enough courage. It's of our lives that we die. If we had the courage to change it all, to run away to some blue coast like that over there, we could live on and on until we were tired. She smiled tolerantly and looked southward through half-shut eyes. I am afraid I should never have courage enough to go beyond that mountain, at least. Look at it. It looks as if it hid horrible things. A sea mist blown in from the Atlantic began to mask the impassive African coast, and above the fog the gray mountain peak took on the angry red of the sunset. It burned sullen and threatening, until the dark land drew the night about her and settled back into the sea. We watched it sink, while under us, slowly but ever increasing, we felt the throb of the Atlantic come and go, the thrill of the vast, untamed waters of that lugubrious and passionate sea. I drew Mrs. Ebling's wraps about her and shut the magnolias under her cloak. When I left her, she slipped me one warm white flower. 4. From the Straits of Gibraltar we dropped into the abyss, and by morning we were rolling in the trough of a sea that drew us down and held us deep, shaking us gently back and forth until the timbers creaked, and then shooting us out on the crest of a swelling mountain. The water was bright and blue, but so cold that the breath of it penetrated one's bones, as if the chill of the deep under fathoms of the sea were being loosed upon us. There were not more than a dozen people upon the deck that morning and Mrs. Ebling was sheltered behind the stern, muffled in a sea-jacket, with drops of moisture upon her long lashes and on her hair. When a shower of ice spray beat back over the deck rail, she took it gleefully. After all, she insisted, this is my own kind of water, the kind I was born in. This is first cousin to the pole waters, and the sea we have left is only a kind of fairy tale. It's like the burnt-out volcanoes. Its day is over. This is the real sea now, where the doings of the world go on. It is not our reality, at any rate, I answered. Oh, yes, it is. These are the waters that carry men to their work, and they will carry you to yours. I sat down and watched her hair grow more alive and iridescent in the moisture. You are pleased to take an attitude, I complained. No, I don't love realities any more than another, but I admit them all the same. And who are you and I to define the realities? Our minds define them clearly enough. 
yours and mine, everybody's. Those are the lines we never cross, though we flee from the equator to the pole. I have never really got out of Finnmark, of course. I shall live and die in a fishing town on the Arctic Ocean, and the blue seas and the pink islands are as much a dream as they ever were. All the same, I shall continue to dream them. The Gulf Stream gave us warm blue days again, but pale like sad memories. The water had faded, and the thin, tepid sunshine made something tighten about one's heart. The stars watched us coldly, and seemed always to be asking me what I was going to do. The advancing line on the chart, which at first had been mere foolishness, began to mean something, and the wind from the west brought disturbing fears and forebodings. I slept lightly, and all day I was restless and uncertain, except when I was with Mrs. Ebling. She quieted me as she did little Karen, and soothed me without saying anything, as she had done that evening at Naples when we watched the sunset. It seemed to me that every day her eyes grew more tender and her lips more calm. A kind of fortitude seemed to be gathering about her mouth, and I dreaded it. Yet when, in an involuntary glance, I put to her the question that tortured me, her eyes always met mine steadily, deep and gentle, and full of reassurance. That I had my word at last happened almost by accident. On the second night out from shore there was the concert for the sailors' orphanage, and Mrs. Ebling dressed and went down to dinner for the first time, and sat on her husband's right. I was not the only one who was glad to see her. Even the women were pleased. She wore a pale green gown, and she came up out of it regally, white and gold. I was so proud that I blushed when anyone spoke of her. After dinner she was standing by her deck chair, talking to her husband when people began to go below for the concert. She took up a long cloak and attempted to put it on. The wind blew the light thing about, and Ebling chatted and smiled his public smile while she struggled with it. Suddenly his roving eye caught sight of the Chicago girl, who was having a similar difficulty with her draperies, and he pranced half the length of the deck to assist her. I had been watching from the rail, and when she was left alone I threw my cigar away and wrapped Mrs. Ebling up roughly. "'Don't go down,' I begged. "'Stay up here. I want to talk to you.' She hesitated a moment and looked at me thoughtfully. Then with a sigh she sat down. Everyone hurried down to the saloon, and we were absolutely alone at last, behind the shelter of the stern, with a thick darkness all about us, and a warm east wind rushing over the sea. I was too sore and angry to think. I leaned toward her, holding the arm of her chair with both hands, and began anywhere. You remember those two blue coasts out of Gibraltar? It shall be either one you choose, if you will come with me. I have not much money. But we shall get on somehow. There has got to be an end of this. We are neither one of us cowards, and this is humiliating, intolerable. She sat looking down at her hands, and I pulled her chair impatiently toward me. I felt, she said at last, that you were going to say something like this. You are sorry for me, and I don't wish to be pitied. You think Ebling neglects me, but you are mistaken. He has had his disappointments, too. He wants children and a gay, hospitable house, and he is tied to a sick woman who cannot get on with people. He has more to complain of than I have, and yet he bears with me. I am grateful to him, and there is no more to be said. Oh, isn't there, I cried. And I? She laid her hand entreatingly upon my arm. Ah, you, you, don't ask me to talk about that. You. Her fingers slipped down my coat sleeve to my hand and pressed it. I caught her two hands and held them, telling her that I would never let them go. And you meant to leave me day after tomorrow, to say good-bye to me as you will to the other people on this boat? You meant to cut me adrift like this, with my heart on fire and all my life unspent in me? She sighed despondently. I am willing to suffer whatever I must suffer, to have had you, she answered simply. I was ill, and so lonely, and it came so quickly and quietly. Ah, don't begrudge it to me. Do not leave me in bitterness. 
If I have been wrong, forgive me. She bowed her head and pressed my fingers entreatingly. A warm tear splashed on my hand. It occurred to me that she bore my anger as she bore little Karen's importunities, as she bore Ebling. What a circle of pettiness she had about her. I fell back in my chair and my hands dropped at my side. I felt like a creature with its back broken. I asked her what she wished me to do. Don't ask me, she whispered. There is nothing we can do. I thought you knew that. You forget that, that I am too ill to begin my life over. Even if there were nothing else in the way, that would be enough. And that is what has made it all possible. Our loving each other, I mean. If I were well, we couldn't have had even this much. Don't reproach me. Hasn't it been at all pleasant to you to find me waiting for you every morning, to feel me thinking of you when you went to sleep? Every night I have watched the sea for you, as if it were mine and I had made it, and I have listened to the water rushing by you, full of sleep and youth and hope, and everything you had done or said during the day came back to me. And when I went to sleep, it was only to feel you more. You see, there was never anyone else. I have never thought of anyone in the dark but you. She spoke pleadingly, and her voice had sunk so low that I could scarcely hear her. And yet you will do nothing, I groaned. You will dare nothing. You will give me nothing. Don't say that. When I leave you day after tomorrow, I shall have given you all my life. I can't tell you how, but it is true. There is something in each of us that does not belong to the family, or to society, or even to ourselves. Sometimes it is given in marriage, and sometimes it is given in love. But oftener it is never given at all. We have nothing to do with giving or withholding it. It is a wild thing that sings in us once and flies away and never comes back. And mine has flown to you. When one loves like that, it is enough somehow. The other things can go if they must. That is why I can live without you and die without you. I caught her hands and looked into her eyes that shone warm in the darkness. She shivered and whispered in a tone so different from any I ever heard from her before or afterward. Do you grudge it to me? You are so young and strong, and you have everything before you. I shall have only a little while to want you in, and I could want you forever and not weary. I kissed her hair, her cheeks, her lips until her head fell forward on my shoulder, and she put my face away with her soft, trembling fingers. She took my hand and held it close to her, in both her own. We sat silent, and the moments came and went, bringing us closer and closer, and the wind and water rushed by us, obliterating our tomorrows and all our yesterdays. The next day Mrs. Ebling kept her cabin, and I sat stupidly by her chair until dark, with the rugged little girl to keep me company, and an occasional nod from the engineer. I saw Mrs. Ebling again only for a few moments, when we were coming into the New York harbor. She wore a street dress and a hat, and these alone would have made her seem far away from me. She was very pale, and looked down when she spoke to me as if she had been guilty of a wrong toward me. I have never been able to remember that interview without heartache and shame. But then I was too desperate to care about anything. I stood like a wooden post and let her approach me, let her speak to me, let her leave me as if it were a hard thing to do, and held out a little package timidly. And her gloved hand shook as if she were afraid of me. I want to give you something, she said. You will not want it now, so I shall ask you to keep it until you hear from me. You gave me your address a long time ago when you were making that drawing. 
Some day I shall write to you and ask you to open this. You must not come to tell me good-bye this morning, but I shall be watching you when you go ashore. Please don't forget that. I took the little box mechanically and thanked her. I think my eyes must have filled, for she uttered an exclamation of pity, touched my sleeve quickly, and left me. It was one of those strange, low, musical exclamations which mean everything and nothing, like the one that had thrilled me that night at Naples, and it was the last sound I ever heard from her lips. An hour later I went on shore, one of those who crowded over the gangplank the moment it was lowered. But the next afternoon I wandered back to the docks and went on board the Germania. I asked for the engineer, and he came up in his shirt sleeves from the engine room. He was red and disheveled, angry and voluble. His bright eye had a hard glint, and I did not once see his masterful smile. When he heard my inquiry, he became profane. Mrs. Ebling had sailed for Bremen on the Hohenstaufen that morning at eleven o'clock. She had decided to return by the northern route and pay a visit to her father in Finnmark. She was in no condition to travel alone, he said. He evidently smarted under her extravagance. But who, he asked, with a blow of his fist on the rail, could stand between a woman and her whim? She had always been a willful girl, and she had a doting father behind her. When she set her head with a the wind, there was no holding her. She ought to have married the Arctic Ocean. I think Ebling was still talking when I walked away. I spent that winter in New York. My consular appointment hung fire. Indeed, I did not pursue it with much enthusiasm. And I had a good many idle hours in which to think of Mrs. Ebling. She had never mentioned the name of her father's village, and somehow I could never quite bring myself to go to the docks when Ebling's boat was in and ask for news of her. More than once I made up my mind definitely to go to Finnmark and take my chance at finding her. The shipping people would know where Ebling came from. But I never went. I have often wondered why. When my resolve was made and my courage high, when I could almost feel myself approaching her, suddenly everything crumbled under me, and I fell back as I had done that night when I dropped her hands, after telling her only a moment before that I would never let them go. In the twilight of a wet March day, when the gutters were running black outside and the square was liquefying under crusts of dirty snow, the housekeeper brought me a damp letter which bore a blurred foreign postmark. It was from Niels Donestadt, who wrote that it was his sad duty to inform me that his daughter, Alexandra Abling, had died on the second day of February, in the twenty-sixth year of her age. Complying with her request, he enclosed a letter which he had written some days before her death. I at last brought myself to break the seal of the second letter. It read thus. My friend, you may open now the little package I gave you. May I ask you to keep it? I gave it to you because there is no one else who would care about it in just that way. Ever since I left you I have been thinking what it would be like to live a lifetime caring and being cared for like that. It was not the life I was meant to live, and yet, in a way, I have been living it ever since I first knew you. Of course you understand now why I could not go with you. I would have spoiled your life for you. Besides that, I was ill, and I was too proud to give you the shadow of myself. I had much to give you, if you had come earlier. As it was, I was ashamed. Vanity sometimes saves us when nothing else will, and mine saved you. Thank you for everything. I hold this to my heart, where I once held your hand. Alexandra The dusk had thickened in the night long before I got up from my chair and took the little box from its place in my desk drawer. I opened it and lifted out a thick coil, cut from where her hair grew thickest and brightest. It was tied firmly at one end, and when it fell over my arm, it curled and clung about my sleeve like a living thing set free. How it gleamed! 
how it still gleams in the firelight. It was warm and softly scented under my lips and stirred under my breath like seaweed in the tide. This and a withered magnolia flower and two pink seashells, nothing more. And it was all twenty years ago. End of On the Gull's Road by Willa Cather Read by Winston Tharp